That was amazing. <laughs> OK, on to some other quite amazing things. Um, American John Barker uh, joins us here from Germany. He uh, has made his career in plastic surgery. But we're not talking about butts, breasts, and bellies but faces. He was one of the first to complete a total face transplant on a human being. Pretty amazing. Um, he is now moving on to more ambitious goals. Instead of transplanting, regenerating. And when you think about how much, um, you know, facial, how much we communicate using facial expressions and hands, his work in regeneration is actually beginning with hands. Um, you know, it's pretty amazing. He's giving people's lives back. I mean, I think about, my husband says, I actually can't hold a conversation without, uh, if my hands were tied behind my back. So that kind of tells you a little bit about, about communication. Um, this shows and sounds a little bit like science fiction, but it is science. Come on up, John. Boy, I'm exhausted after that last <laughs> <laughs> Um Thank you, Pink. Um, I have been at previous Pinks in, in Europe, and I am delighted, as I'm sure the organizers are, that um, this one has gotten off to such a great start. Um, today, I'm going to talk about research that I've done over the last about 20 years. Um, the beginning of that was in uh, the United States, here in the United States, in Louisville, Kentucky. And for the last four to five years, I've now been in Germany. And so um, in Louisville, when I say I, I don't usually say I, because in this field, it's not I, it's we. But this is the team of people that it took to achieve hand transplantation, the first hand transplants. Um, and this was a multidisciplinary team. There's psychiatrists, there's eth eth uh, bioethicists, there's pathologists, hand surgeons, you name it. And um, this work was done between um, 89 and 2010. 2010 is when I moved to Germany. This is my team in Germany, part of my team in Germany. Um, also, I, I forgot to say, but it's also done between several institutions. Uh, in Germany, we work with Poland. We continue to work with the United States with uh, Louisville, Maastricht in the Netherlands. And um, so, first, a little background on our hands and faces. We take our hands and our faces pretty much for granted. Um, you, 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 when you think to yourself, what, what, what are your hands? I mean, you just think, well, it's what I write with. It's what I, you know, if you're Italian, you speak with your hands. Um, but basically, our hands, ever since we, millions of years ago, we stood up from all fours and started using our hands as tools, it became, our hands became very much part of our personalities. And in this, you can just see that these are not functions of just writing or shaking somebody's hand or something. These are expressions. We use our hands to express ourselves, very much so. Um, and of course, this is what happens when you lose your hands. You lose not only the ability to do these functional things, but also it's a huge part of, of your personality. And in fact, in our patients, that received hand transplants, when I would ask them years later, you know, what has been the greatest part of getting a hand transplant? Matt, particularly, I'll show you a picture of Matt. He was the first one in, that was done. Um, he said, you know, wearing a wedding ring or walking in the grocery store holding my daughter's hand, he says, you know, I feel whole now. And so when you think about it, you know, you think, well, no, the hand is so he can tie his shoe, he can do, I mean, those aren't the things that he found most important. And um, of course your face, oh, if the hand is important, I mean, expressing or communicating with people, 
look at these expressions and how you don't have to use any words. Um, here, the one that is has a name underneath it, that's Jackie. Jackie was one of our first patients we talked with. Jackie was here in Florida studying English from Venezuela. She was 17 years old, and a drunk driver ran into her car, killed her two friends. She was burned to crisp when they arrived. They thought she was dead, uh, but they did save her. And this is Jackie today. And this is, this is Jackie after 45 operations in the best centers in the United States. So this isn't right after the accident. This is after she's been treated many, many, many times. And um, imagine what it must be like for Jackie. She's a brave young lady. She goes out and talks in public against drunk driving. But most of the patients, most of the people we have, if I brought Jackie here in front of you, you would feel so uncomfortable just looking at her. It's hard for us to look in the face of somebody that looks like this. Well, imagine how she feels now. So these people are basically, they live socially dead. They live in their little houses, and they don't go out. And that's, that's the life they lead. So when this is what we were treating. So when I talk about the research, this is where it started, and this is where it ends. And even the research now in Frankfurt is still exactly the same thing. It's about the patients. So this is a little bit talking about what is done today. Today, if you get your limb cut off and you're lucky enough to bring it into the medical center, they sew it back on. And that gives very good results. This young girl in, from India, she got her hair caught in a th threshing machine that, that uh, beats the rice, and it tore her whole face off. Luckily, her mother put that tissue into a bag. They got on the back of a little motorcycle, and they went to one hospital asking if they could fix it, and if they didn't have the ability to do this. It takes microsurgery. Went to three different hospitals, and finally the guy who said, yeah, we can do it, sewed it back on. And that is a fabulous result right there. I mean, that, that is unbelievable. And the reason that you get that result is because they're using face tissue to make a face. In other words, they're using exactly the same tissue. That's both in the replant and in this case. Other ways of treating is, for instance, skin grafts with Jackie. We took skin from all other parts of her body, and that's the result you get when you get skin grafts. In this particular case, we take a skin flap, and the difference is instead of a very thin piece of skin, you take a large piece of skin that with its blood supply, this patient we had, he had a motorcycle, gasoline got inside of the helmet, burned. And this is this procedure you do. You put a flap and, you know, this is a great procedure because it saved his life, but he looks like he has his back on his face. So aesthetically, it's really not very good, but it's a great operation in terms of covering that wound. And then, of course, transferring. You can use the toe to make a thumb. That's done pretty routinely. And then, of course, we have prosthesis. Uh, this fellow got a bad infection in his nasal cavities, and so um, all of that had to be dissected out. You put buttons and snaps in there. An artist makes that prosthesis, and he snaps it out in the morning when he goes out. So those are the current treatments, or those were the treatments when we started this research in um, transplantation. These, that's Matt that I mentioned wearing his wedding ring. This is the hand that he got transplanted from a dead person that was killed in an accident. And that's the hand about two years out. Matt is now 13 years out, doing well. And this is a face transplant done in, um, by a, a group friend in uh, Maryland. And so that is about two years out after a face transplant. 
Of course, these results are so good because they're using face tissue to make a face, or they're using hands, human hands, to make a hand. Those other procedures that I showed, you're using other tissue and trying to make it into a face. Well, those are the results you get. So um, in Louisville, we were, we were lucky to stumble on, and I say that honestly, a combination of drugs. The reason that there had been kidney and liver transplants for 50 years and there had never been hand transplants until 10 years ago was because each of the tissues in our body have a different rejectability, if you will. So if I took my cornea and I transplanted it into you, you wouldn't even need immunosuppression. It won't reject. But if I transplant a kidney, it's a lot more antigenic, and so it will reject. You need a certain amount of drugs to suppress the immune system so it doesn't reject. Well, the skin is the most rejectable of all the tissues in our body, and if you think about it, it makes sense. The skin is the barrier between the outside world. One of its functions is to keep out anything foreign, and so that's why that had not been done. A hand transplant or a face transplant, it's the same immunologically. Your immune system doesn't really care whether it's a face or a hand. What it cares about is the skin, the presence of skin. And so we did experiments, and I'm not gonna tell you what the whole experiment was, but this was our control group at the bottom. We, we would put, for instance, a pump. What was important is to stop the rejection, in other words, very powerful immunosuppression where you need it, but not so powerful that it would kill the patient. So we had ideas like we put a pump in and we would put drug just in the limb so that less drug would be in the body. We took drugs and we attached them to small pieces of metal. We injected those in systemically and then we put a magnet around the limb so all the drug would go where we wanted it. We were trying all kinds of things to see how we could do this. And we said, okay, the control group is going to be this cocktail of drugs that's being used in kidney transplant. Nobody had ever used it for hand. They didn't know if it worked or not. After about a month or two, we, the, the one on the top, which is the one with the pump, was going bad. We found out that the drug was eating the inside of our pump. So I was flying all over the place trying to figure out what is it in the drug that's eating our pumps, et cetera, et cetera. And the students came to me and said, hey, look at the control group. <laughs> no, that's nonsense, that can't work. And sure enough, after three months, so for us it was a big deal because of course if the pump had worked, we would still be fighting with the FDA trying to get it approved for this application. That is a drug combination that was being used clinically already for kidney transplant. So we immediately got permission to do 10 cases and now all the cases that have been done are using that particular cocktail of drugs. This is the first face transplant done in France. Uh, this woman got a dog bit off that tissue and she got that transplant and this is from a, a cadaver, a, well, cadaver, a, a brain dead donor. And this is her about a year out. She's now uh, 14 years out. Um, these are all the transplants, hand transplants, we did in Louisville, eight of them. Uh, there's been 150 now done around the world. These are all the face transplants that have been done around the world. Uh, face transplant is still experimental, but hand transplant, you can go into Mayo Clinic or UCLA and you just say you want a hand transplant and if you qualify, you can get a hand transplant, so it's not experimental anymore. And here comes the other side of it. If you get a hand transplant, just like a liver transplant or a heart transplant, you have to take these powerful drugs the rest of your life. And that's not, that's not a small thing. In addition, once we had approval to do a hand transplant in Louisville, it took us a year to get a donor. There aren't many donors. And so that whole thing of donor availability 
and of course the fact that you have to take immunosuppression the rest of your life makes this not an ideal treatment. And so when another approach, which I'm studying now in Germany, is the whole idea of uh, regrowing your hands. And you, you, everybody has read about this, where the stem cells and tissue engineering and everything, and this is what our research is in, in Germany now. If you look in nature, does anybody know in high school, did you ever do the little planaria experiments? These are great little guys. I mean, they're this big. You cut them into two pieces, and it will grow a head and a tail. Three pieces, it'll do the same. And I don't know who did, actually, I finally did find the article, but some guy actually cut one of these into 279 pieces. And it grew 279 heads and 279 tails. 280 doesn't work anymore. <laughs> I mean, that's real. I used to say that. I'd heard it before. But I actually found the article with this guy. I'd like to meet that guy. Because can you imagine cutting something this big into 279 pieces? Um, frogs, when they are tadpoles, you can cut their tail off and it will grow back. The red circle there, that's called a blastema. Where it's growing back, that is called a blastema. A salamander, could you play the video, please? A salamander, now, you all know about that. We're going to that. have a look at you the can way turn off in which. The sound. And this is when you cut the salamander's limb off. This is what happens. It grows right back, and that takes about six weeks. So in nature, this also exists. And of course, every year, a deer grows back that beautiful rack of antlers. They fall off in the winter, and all of that grows back every single year. So in nature, regeneration does occur. We use that to try to learn in children less than 10 years of age. If the tip of their t finger gets cut off, it will grow back. And so we, our, our bodies know how to do this. We lose the ability as we get older. And then, of course, if you think about it, when you were a fetus, you grew a hand originally. So the mechanism of how to grow a hand is on our genome. Our genome knows how to grow a hand. And so the question is, is Number one, why does it turn off as we get older? And could we go in and somehow turn it back on? We don't have to invent how to make a hand. Our genome knows how to make a hand. It's just, how do we turn it back on? And then, of course, all of you have read about tissue engineering, where they actually get a scaffold. They seed it with stem cells, and then they grow these different. These are all clinical cases here that have been done in the news where a trachea, skin, a vagina, all of these have been built on a bench, implanted into people, and there are some that are eight years, 10 years out now. So what is our research? We look at the blastema in these different animals, and we try to understand what is the magic going on. How can we find the switch to turn it back on? And of course, it's in that blastema. It's in that, that, that is where this is happening. In fact, what's interesting, if you get a cut or if you get an injury, the first step of healing is the same in a salamander as it is in us. It's just that the second step, the salamander keeps growing its limb back, and we just form a scar. And so, it's very close to what we already do. So what do we do? At the University of Kentucky, they have done the genome of the salamander. Of course, we have the human genome. The mouse genome has been around a while. So some of our research is we compare those three genomes, looking at the place where the limbs grow and trying to figure out 
what is different about that? And at the University of Kentucky, um, uh, Randall Voss and his team has actually identified 300 different locations that are unique and are different in the salamander. Always, of course, looking for that switch. These are the stem cells, the famous stem cells that everybody reads about. Uh, there's one type of stem cell called a very small embryonic-like stem cell that's in all of our tissues. It's just recently been discovered. The thing that's unique about these very small stem cells is that they are the mothers of these stem cells. What does that mean? Most stem cells that you find in an adult body are already determined to become bone, muscle, nerve, different tissues. These, since they are the mothers of those tissues, they aren't. And so they call that pluripotent, where they can develop into any kind of tissue. We've identified these. We're taking these and injecting them into stumps of amputated animals and seeing what's happening. Uh, we have a clinical trial going on right now in Germany where we put a scaffold into these large bone defects. We put bone stem cells inside that scaffold. We've done uh, 10 patients now. It works well. We've, this was phase one, so it's the safety. Now we start phase two, which is the effectiveness. Um, electrical stimulation. We do experiments where we put electricity at the stumps of amputated limbs. And look, the red circle, what we're getting. It's like a blastema. It's similar to a blastema. Could you run the video, please? Just to show you what electricity does. We're now, these are the cells. These are stem cells. This is no electricity. Watch what happens when I turn on the electricity. So electricity affects stem cells very much so. And we're trying to figure out how to direct that and hopefully turn on that switch. So our research focuses on the blastema in different models, in different animal models, and uh, cells, these different things we're talking about, using electrical stimulation. And of course, with that, we hope that one day we'll grow hands. Thank you. We're Dutch, remember? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> that was absolutely fascinating. <laughs>